Okay, I am going live. Hello, everybody. We'll be starting here in just a few minutes. Um, we've got uh, three telescopes going. We've got some clear skies uh, here, so it should be a, a good evening here in Tucson, Arizona, but I'll be back with you in a few minutes. While we're waiting, uh, our astronomers are getting their scopes set up. It's just now starting to get dark enough here. So they'll have to do an alignment um, to get the, the computer set up and going. So the telescope knows where it's, uh, where it's looking and, and what is able to go to the objects they want to do. So they're getting that stuff going. And uh, they should have that ready shortly. Probably start off with uh, talking a little bit about the night sky. So we'll share out an astronomy uh, planetarium program and talk a little bit about the night sky. But we'll give it a couple more minutes and we'll get started. So we'll give it about another minute and we'll get started. Okay, let me stop this one and we will switch over to a planetarium program and talk just a few minutes about what's up in the night sky. So the program you see here that's, well, actually first, let me start over. Let me, uh, let me just tell you again, welcome um, to our quarterly desert sky virtual star party. Uh, we're coming to you from Tucson, Arizona. We are the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association. And we started doing these during COVID, but uh, we decided uh, um, once we started doing live events again, 
that we uh, wanted to uh, keep the, the virtual star parties going. So we're, we're doing them quarterly. Uh, so uh, tonight you'll have an opportunity to see some pretty cool uh, objects. Um, we were talking before we started the stream that uh, uh, this is kind of galaxy season. Uh, you know, as you go into the summer, there's just a lot of galaxies out there, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but um, you'll see a lot of uh, a lot of galaxies tonight, and uh, hopefully a, a good variety of uh, of some other stuff as well. After we do the first object set of objects, then I'm going to uh, before we start the second set, I will be um, having each of the astronomers introduce themselves, and we'll uh, share out what uh, equipment they're using so that you have an idea of of uh, what they're using to see. So while we're waiting for them to get everything set up and going, um, you'll see here, uh, this is a, a planetarium program called Stellar, or is uh, called Stellarium. It's a free program. So if you go to stellarium.org, you can actually download it for your uh, computer. And uh, this is what it's, this is showing the current sky as of tonight at this time. So if you were outside and looking west, I'm very low on the horizon, you'll see Orion and the belt of Orion. And just above it, you'll see Gemini, the twins. You'll see two, uh, two stars, Castor and Pollock side by side. And then Gemini right now has an interloper called Mars. Mars is in there too, and it'll be distinctively a different color than, than the other two. Uh, and then uh, going towards the south, you'll have coming up, um, you've got, Corvus, the uh, Leo is pretty high up. Leo is kind of interesting and pretty visible when you're looking at it. Uh, when you when you look for Leo, you'll see what looks like a backwards question mark, and that's kind of the mame of the lion. And then the body will be out uh, to the left of the uh, question mark. To its left is uh, Virgo, uh, and Libra is down below Virgo. And then towards the east is the constellation of Boates. Uh, it'll kind of look like a kite. Some say it looks like a uh, ice cream cone. So either one depends on uh, what you're in the mood for. It's either a kite or an ice cream cone. Below it is uh, Hercules. And uh, and that's a, got a great uh, um, globular cluster in that. Uh, above uh, and towards the north, you'll see the Big Dipper, Ursa Major. And the, the usual asterism of the bucket and then the handle arcing here. Um, and this is the Big Dipper. The bear is upside down, so his legs are pointing up. And uh, the two bucket stars here in Ursa Major, the end of the bucket of the Big Dipper, will point to the North Star. And there's the North Star down to the lower left of Ursa Major. And that is Ursa Minor, or the little bear, and it's right side up. And uh, Polaris is the end of the handle, and then you'll see the bucket. Most people, if you don't have really good dark skies, can only see Polaris and these two end bucket stars. Um, but if you've got good skies, you, you can see these other stars in the constellation, and, and, it's, uh, and that'll give you an idea if you've got the good skies. Uh, and then looking off to the uh, uh, north, and then we're cruising back around towards the west. So anyway, that's a quick view of the night sky. Uh, Bernie, are you ready to go? I am. All right, I'm gonna yep. stop the share so, and the screen is yours. Finally got dark enough here to uh, have something to work with. Whenever you're ready, you got it. And as I mentioned earlier, while we're waiting for Bernie to come up on comms, that we do have three uh, telescopes here, um, three very different telescopes. So it'll be uh, you'll be able to see when we start talking to those. Um, you'll be able to see what kinds of telescopes they're using, but we'll let them show you their first object each first, and then we'll go and show you the, the telescopes. All right, looks like Bernie's bringing up a screen. So you can, Bernie, you can walk them through that as you want to.
There. Can you hear me now? Yes. Now I got you. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I was trying to find the icon for the audio. So, um, and of course, now what I was going to show you. There it is. Okay. There we so go. I want to start with. Uh, I want to start with uh, something that's a little unusual uh, in the sky. Uh, Jim was talking earlier about asterisms. Uh, asterisms are groupings of stars that form a shape, uh, maybe a, a, a fairly well-known shape. And probably the most obvious asterism that people know about uh, is uh, the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is not a constellation. The Big Dipper is an asterism that's inside the constellation of Ursa Major. Uh, which is a much larger grouping of stars or constellation than just the Big Dipper. So a smaller version of an asterism and one that is uh, can be uh, seen with, uh, with a telescope, uh, you can't visually see it, uh, possibly with a very good pair of binoculars. Uh, but with a telescope, you can find other asterisms in the sky. And this is a, a fairly famous one, uh, is called the number 37. And uh, if you catch it just right in the sky, it indeed does look like the number 37. Um, it kind of brings back memories of, of the old television series, uh, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, in one of the episodes of that series, uh, the main characters go up to the, 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 the biggest supercomputer in the universe and ask it what the meaning of life is. And it tells them to come back in a few years uh, after it works it out. And so they come back in a few years and they say, what is the meaning of life? And the computer says the number 42. Um, and of course, that, um, that was the humor of um, that particular program. Uh, I, I kind of, I kind of say, well, it, it's not forty-two; it's thirty-seven, because the number thirty-seven is up there uh, in the heavens, and everybody can see it. So, uh, it certainly looks like the number thirty-seven to a lot of people. And I thought I'd show you that it's. Uh, the 37 is actually uh, some of the brightest stars of a grouping of stars uh, or open cluster. Uh, there's actually about 30 members of that star cluster, uh, but the, the ones that form the 37 are the brightest uh, O-type stars, the, the brightest stars of the cluster. And why it's shaped by 37? No one really knows. All right. Yeah, very good. And that is in the constellation of Orion, right, Bernie? Yes, uh, northern Orion, no, northern parts of Orion, which is very difficult to see right now because uh, Orion is setting in the western sky in the sky glow. And if you look on the image there, you can easily tell in the lower right, there's a lot of glow from, from the sunset yet. But I right. was just able to catch it um, while, the, um, while the constellation is still up. Another, another week or two and it's gone for the season. Yeah, Orion is a typically a winter constellation, so it is in its waning times. All right, um, Jim, over to you. Okay, let me um, try to get myself to where I belong here. I'm going to share my screen. Now I'm going to go to an asterism as well. At least the 37 cluster has a catalog number. Mine's just got a name. And in a, it does have an entry in an obscure catalog that only double star 
hunters usually reference. And let's see if I can get this going. Um, this one. And the second button, there it is. And one last thing I gotta hit here. Yeah. How to get my script. Um, this real interesting looking asterism is called the Stargate asterism or the Stargate cluster. It's an asterism in the constellation Corvus, the crow, real close to the constellation Virgo. And it has six stars. Um, it's also known at, in the double star catalog as STF 1659. And that was put together, that catalog was put together by a Russian astronomer named Friedrich Georg Wilhelm von Struve. And he started this in 1822. So he put this entry in there around 20, uh, I mean, 1845 or so. Von Struve was born in Denmark, but his family relocated to Russia to avoid being conscripted into Napoleon's army. So he was a draft dodger and spent the rest of his life until the late 1800s um, living as a, as a very renowned astronomer in Russia. Um, the stars that you see form vertices of two nested triangles, one kind of right side up, the other upside down. It resembles the portal device that was featured in the 19, um, 1979 Buck Rogers um, science fiction TV uh, series, uh, uh, Buck Rogers in the 25th century. Um, it's near the galaxy M104, and it's about, those stars um, are anywhere from 285 to 485 uh, light years away. So they, they're actually separated in and out of the screen you're looking at by over, by about 200 light years. That's quite a bit of separation, but to our eyes, we see that. And so that uh, um, picked up the name Stargate, uh, it didn't have a name before that. And that, um, that little um, group of stars is really fascinating to look at because, and the reason it stands out so much, being in the constellation Corvus and near Virgo, that's actually looking up out of the galaxy. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, is sort of like um, a CD or DVD or a, uh, a pizza in space. And it's sitting there, and if we look in our galaxy, we only see lots of starry things. Um, everything from great clusters, globular clusters, um, and asterisms like this are kind of rare because there's too many stars. When you look out of the galaxy like we are in this season, uh, when we look up, we actually are looking towards galaxies that we can see. So tonight we're going to be seeing an awful lot of galaxies, not a whole lot of clusters. But this one happens to stand out with uh, uh, sitting there um, in the upper part of the galaxy, but still within the galaxy. So that's the Stargate asterism or the Stargate cluster. And it's kind of nice. It really jumps out without other stars around that can use it. Yeah. Hey, Jim. Yeah, I mean, Jim.
Jim, can you hear me? Now I can. I I don't I wasn't hearing I don't anything hear, there. I don't hear Jim. Do you hear me, uh, Jim O'Connor? I can hear both can hear of you. you. Now I can hear. Can if you can hear me, then that's okay. Yeah, I think the three of us can hear each other, but I don't think Jim is hearing us, or or maybe. Well, I'm going to go ahead and present my object. <laughs> uh, ask Jim for a thumbs up if it's still broadcasting. I don't even know if it's broadcasting out. If... Give us a thumbs up, Jim, if you're still broadcasting. Okay. Your mic's not working, Jim. So what I, you guys can see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, very nice, very nice capture. Okay. So everybody, what we're looking at here, this is known as Markarian's chain. Um, it's a chain of galaxies up in the uh, Virgo constellation area. The, um, Markarian was an astronomer, and this was this chain was named after him. Uh, there's several objects in here which were to, um, also discovered by Charles Messier and have um, Messier numbers um, assigned to them. Specifically, two of these galaxies are M84 and M86. But you'll see this this little chain running down through here, and then curving back up here, and in this whole region of space is a very rich um, galaxy field. There, there, are, there are hundreds, if not thousands of galaxies in this area. And in fact, uh, down here to the, you can see where my pointer is, there's a little one down there, there's a little one down here, down towards the bottom, there's some more distant ones down there. Um, all of these galaxies you're seeing are, they're at different distances from us. Um, but largely they're all in that um in the 65 million light year range which is uh pretty far away from us that means the light you're seeing um left these objects 65 million years ago so it's a interesting shot to be able to see so many galaxies in one location if i were to take longer exposures more and more distant galaxies would come forward and you'd be able to see them I'm doing fairly short um, exposures here right now. So. so that is the Markarian chain. That one is always a really cool one to look at in a telescope, uh, either visually or certainly with a camera. Yeah, it's just to see so many at once is just a, a treat. And one of those, I believe, is M87, which is the one that many of you may have heard, uh, you know, several years ago, and they took the picture of the supermassive black hole at its center. I, I don't there. think so, Jim. I think M87 is below it. Oh, is it? I was thinking it was in the chain. Mm, not to my knowledge. I think it's just below the arc. Okay. I might be wrong yeah. on that. Somebody want to tell me I'm right or wrong? Well, I know 84 and 86 are in that circle that uh, right. Rick has there to the right, the bright ones. But uh, I'm not sure about 87. I've never, I, everything else I've heard in that area have been NGC numbers. All right, yeah. So that's a really cool one to look at. Uh, like I said, both visually and uh, in in telescope or in uh, com images so that you can see um, so many galaxies. Um, and, you know, you just start really looking at even some of these small, faint ones, they're, they're galaxies. If they're, they're looking like a little fuzzy spot out there, then, then they're, uh, they're galaxies. So there's a lot of them in there. All right, thanks, Rick. Uh-huh. Um, all right, uh, let's switch over to Bernie and I'm gonna bring up, um, while Bernie's uh, getting ready, I'm going to share my screen and start with uh, showing Bernie's scope so we can talk a little bit about it. So there's Bernie's telescope, if you want to talk, Bernie. 
There we go. Uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, the scope I'm using tonight is uh, on what's called an EV scope. Uh, EV Edward Victor. Um, it's made by Unistellar, uh, which is a French firm. Uh, these are relatively new on the market. They've been out for a couple of years now. Uh, they're great for star parties uh, because they're very easy to uh, set up, uh, lightweight, uh, and you can get them up and running in minutes. And the, the real nice part about it is it's almost totally automatic. Uh, you turn it on and, and just tell it where you want it to go. Um, so very handy in, um, in star parties. All right, I'll stop the share and you can uh, talk about your next object. All right. Okay. Share screen. Go. And up. All right, is that coming through? Yes, it is. All right. Um, what I'm going to look at in, uh, with this uh, image, uh, which I just brought in, uh, this is a, a little unusual, um, but um, something that happens fairly frequently in the universe. We're going to look at a supernova. Now, supernova are stars that um, reach a critical point in their lifetime and uh, explode. Um, it's a very complicated procedure, but uh, at, in essence, they, they gravity wins over the, the force of fusion and it compresses down to the point where it can't hold itself back any longer. And, um, uh, and does an, an, an uh, what's called a supernova explosion. Many of the heavier elements in the periodic table of elements are created in supernova explosions. Supernovas don't occur that often in our own galaxy. The last one that was recorded was uh, Kepler's star, it was actually a supernova, uh, Kepler's star back in the 1600s, I believe. Um, so they don't happen very often. In fact, the Milky Way, our galaxy is kind of overdue uh, for a, uh, uh, a supernova. And everyone's always excited about, oh, maybe one's going to happen soon. Um, Betelgeuse, just uh, last year, or so um, looked like it might go supernova, but then it turned around it didn't, uh, to many people's disappointment. However, supernovas, because there's so many galaxies out there, supernovas are occurring on a regular basis, but in other galaxies. So if we want to study supernovas, we have to look at other galaxies. Um, and this is one, this, this is a supernova that just occurred uh, back on the 20th of April. So this one is only a few weeks old and it's in uh, a galaxy called NGC 4995. That's that fuzzy patch right dead center in the middle. Uh, not the star, but the fuzzy patch. So I'm going to expand it out and that fuzzy patch is the galaxy, uh, NGC 499, uh, 4995. That galaxy is 80 million light years away. So it's very faint, it's very small, um, and um, just reachable in good dark skies. Now, the central core of that galaxy is quite bright. It has a, almost a, st a stellar central core. That's the, the bright spot right in the middle 
of the fuzzy patch. But just to the right of the fuzzy patch, if you will, just to, to the right of the galaxy center uh, is another fainter spot, and that is the supernova. Uh, this supernova uh, was discovered by uh, a, a, a series of telescopes around the world called the Atlas System. And uh, there's a couple in Hawaii, there's one in South Africa, there's one in Chile. And they automatically scan the sky uh, for uh, anything moving or new transient objects. And the Atlas system picked this up uh, four weeks ago when it occurred. So it's a, a brand new supernova, and it's already been photographed and studied to a certain extent. Um, it's about magnitude 15, which is very faint, um, but it's also a type 2 supernova. So a type 2 supernova is a, a massive star that um, reached its, the end of its lifetime and collapsed down and did a rebound uh, into a massive supernova explosion. And that bright point there, just to the right, uh, is that star. So you're looking at a single star amongst billions of stars that make up that, um, that galaxy. So kind of neat. I always enjoy looking at supernovas. And you said, uh, Bernie, that was 83 million light years away? 80 million. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. Three. <laughs> so so you're, you're pulling out a single star in a constellation or a galaxy that's 80 million light years away. I mean, that's just amazing. Right. And not only that, but we can tell what kind of star it is. Um, based on the type of supernova that it, it created. Yeah, it's, uh, it's absolutely amazing. Um, Dane asks on YouTube, uh, and you can explain this, Bernie, says, is there a reason why this looks like a slideshow rather than an active video? It looks like the telescope is capturing a frame every minute. Well, uh, keep in mind, we're using cameras here. Uh, to be able to broadcast this out to you. Um, the, it's impossible to, to do a video without using a camera. Um, uh, the slideshow, yeah, to a certain extent, I guess you could say that because cameras, uh, cameras are gathering light over a period of time. Um, and because this this particular galaxy is so distant and so faint, uh, the camera in my telescope is integrating over a period of time uh, and then um, uh, presenting it on the screen. Uh, if it was a brighter object, then the integration time would be shorter and it would probably look more like uh, a straight video image. Uh, but the way, way it is now, because it has to integrate over a, over a, uh, about 10, 15 seconds just to gather enough light, it, it will have kind of a slideshow appearance. Yeah, that's a good explanation. And yeah, great question, Dane, thanks. Um, all right, uh, Jim, are you ready to talk a little bit about your equipment and then your next object? Let's see. Yeah, I think I can do that. Um, Talking about uh, looking like a slideshow versus real, I'm playing with real over here right now, where I had two different wires get disconnected but not look disconnected. I've been chasing an object all over the sky, but I think I got it. Okay, what you see in front of you is what I'm sitting at tonight. Um, the telescope itself is a 10-inch mid mid cassegrain type telescope. Um, up on the top of the telescope on the left, you see a little camera. That little camera is taking snapshots of the sky when I tell it to line itself up. So it will automatically steer to four different parts of the sky. And in each one of those parts, it will grab 
100 stars in that little camera and compare it to what it thinks it should see at that location that it went. And it will do that at all four of those places and solve it to get a really good understanding of the sky around it. And the right side is something to do, uh, to do something like that the old-fashioned way. That's called a Telrad finder. It puts a little bullseye on the sky if I look behind it and helps me steer to things um, that I can see with my uh, naked eyes, like some planets that might be up there or some bright stars I want to go to or, so, or something else. Um, the real thing that's showing the pretty stuff is right on the back of the telescope. You can see a, a rectangular black box. That's called a Mellencamp Exterminator 2 um, video uh, or astronomical video camera, astronomical imaging camera. It uh, takes the, what you see coming in, and it actually has a display, a video chip of 377,000 pixels on it, which is peanuts compared to what, uh, what Bernie and Rick are doing. But it's uh, but they're the, some of the most sensitive on the planet as far as grabbing things. It's just that they're pretty big and pretty uh, sparse. So it doesn't quite get uh, pretty details on things, but it really goes deep in space and grabs the information pretty fast. For example, that um, that uh, image I was showing of um, of the Fargate asterism, uh, it took three seconds to get that picture. And the, and the actual image itself, the, the whole image you were seeing was less than a third of a degree. So if you hold your, your little finger at arm's length, the fleshy part on the side of your nail is just about what you're seeing there. Um, so it, it does good work uh, with, with little things if it's got a good telescope with it. All the cables you see behind it, I get two data lines from it. One line is used for what I'm broadcasting here, converting the analog signal in the camera to digital and send it out. That's called S-Video. Then I have another a second cable that sends video, and that's going over to that monitor. And that uses a coaxial cable with, a, a, if you know about these things, BNC connector on one side and RCA to go into the TV. And on that TV, you can see, uh, you almost can see uh, some printing on it. And that's uh, an on-screen display of the camera status right then where I've done a check. The reason you see all that, um, all that uh, uh, wiring there is because those wires are set up to go 25 to 50 feet. And so they can't hide, you know, they, it's hard to make them hide. And in addition, the power supply that's coming to it, the 12 volt power supply has five branches off of it. And I only need two. I need uh, one for the camera and one for the uh, uh, mount that's steering it. And the last thing is the mount it's sitting on is the Celestron AVX. It's really good at carrying moderate weights and doing uh, for, for a limited expense. For doing, um, for doing uh, just general um, amateur work in the backyard with a telescope. It just, uh, I've had it for seven years and it's really served me very well. And it does allow that camera on the uh, top of the, of the telescope to send it information and it does all the computing of where it is on the face of the earth. So that's my camera. Uh, my personal display monitor, I got another cable sending it out to you on my laptop, and I'm sitting at that table with my laptop trying to steer it all. And that's about everything I've got there, Jim. All right, I'm going to stop the share, and you can take it over for your next object. I'll give it a shot. I found two uh, wires were disconnected, and I'm hoping I got an image now. <laughs> and now I got to go to the other thing to get an image. And... Am I getting anything? Oh, brother. If you're not, we'll slide over to Rick. I'm not, and I don't know. It's just the S-Video cable. I got it fine on the big monitor. I got a full screen full of stuff. But okay, not, if you want to work not it, pulling we'll, in this uh, channel. we'll switch over to uh, Rick. So, Rick, are you ready to give it a shot? And then we'll come back to Jim when he's got it. Yeah, out. sure. You going to bring up my equipment first? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Let me do that. You can start talking uh, to it, but I'll bring it up. Yeah, so let's see here. Yeah, so what uh, 
what I've got set up is exactly what you're seeing right now. I just took this picture a little while ago before it got dark. Um, I have a four inch refractor telescope. It uses lenses rather than mirrors to gather the light and magnify the image. Um, on the back, the large red canister on the back is the camera. It's a ZWO uh, 26 megapixel cooled camera. Uh, the cooling helps reduce the noise when I'm taking long exposures. The um, the little black tube on top of the main telescope, that is my guide scope. Um, and there's a little red camera on the back of it. It is looking at a small section of the sky at stars. And the software on my computer is tracking those stars and making minute adjustments to my mount to keep it aligned on those stars perfectly so I don't get star trails over, over time. And then the big... The big, you can see my, my mount below there, my large uh, um, lot, lot, lot Lost Mandy mount. And then I'm sitting here in front of my computer right next to it. And I've got various pieces of software that are controlling all of this and letting you see all these uh, images. Okay, very good. I'll stop the share and you can show your next object. Yeah, got something here. So we have another galaxy. Um, this one, it's uh, it's a little off center there, right right there in the center, um, is uh, known as it doesn't have a very fun name. It's just uh, NGC five zero seven eight. The NGC stands for New General Catalog. Um, but this is a this is a very dim, distant galaxy. It's only tenth magnitude in our skies, which means it's you're not going to see with see this with, with with your naked eye, and it actually takes a fairly powerful telescope to see this at all. Um, it's a hundred million light years away from us. So where the last one I showed you was sixty five million light years, this is another good reach out there, a hundred million light years. Um, it's located in the constellation Hydra. And it's it's actually it's a it's a spiral galaxy. It's hard to see in this image, but it is a spiral galaxy. It is pretty small, and um, it's moving away from us at around uh, two thousand kilometers per second, which is actually a pretty good clip for something to be to be moving away from us. And then you also see in the upper left, there's another galaxy over there, and then down towards the bottom of the screen, there's another galaxy down there. Uh, I zoom in a little bit. Yeah, I'm getting a little bit too zoomed in for my good here, but you can see the the galaxy sitting there, a little bit of a dust line coming through it. So is that a, a small satellite galaxy of it, just above it? You think, or don't you know? Uh, hold on, let me let me look at that for you. No, I think that's a bright. That might be a, it might not be just showing up on, on my computer here. It might be another uh, dim galaxy in the distance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It looks like it's, and then there's our, away. there's the, there's the full resolution of the image. You can see some other, other things here. Yeah. I like, uh, you know, especially in images, but even visually, there's a lot of times when you're, you know, you put a telescope on on a galaxy and you can see three or four galaxies in the eyepiece. And it's just, you know, it's just mind boggling when you're looking at that. And you think, you know, some of these galaxies are 60, 70, 80 million light years away. So the light yeah. you're seeing um, took that long to get to your eyes. So if it was, for instance, if it was 66 million light years away, it means that that light left that galaxy 66 million years ago, which if everybody remembers your your ancient history, that was when the dinosaurs were having a yep. really bad day. Well, 100 million years ago, they were have the dinosaurs were having a party. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and 30 million light years after that, they were having problems. So it's just you know it's, you're you're a time traveler when you do. Uh, you do astronomy and it's just kind of i mean not a lot changes even in 60 million years but it's still kind of cool that you're looking back in time 
All right. Thanks. I think Jim's still working on his. Uh, so no, I, I got it. Oh, okay. Then we'll go to you. Okay. Let me grab the screen here. And one other thing I always forget to get some. Yeah. Okay, the object there is uh, Messier 13, which doesn't mean much unless you know it's a great globular cluster in Hercules, the constellation Hercules. It holds several hundred thousand stars um, in that tight ball. It's about 145 light years across. So if you think about the nearest star to us is about four, this, uh, this object occupies a space that's uh, about 45 times bigger than, the, uh, than that one uh, uh, star is from us. It's a big object. Um, the question is, what is it? There is a lot of uh, uh, curiosity about this because this type of article, a globular cluster, has an age that um, is older than most of the stars in the Milky Way. And the other thing that's unusual is the Milky Way only has about 150 of them circling the, the, our galaxy. And other galaxies like Andromeda has over 4,000. So we don't have very many and they're very, very old. So the curiosity was where they come from. They tend to run from about 11 billion years old to uh, as much as 13 billion years old, which you know is real close to when the universe started. and the uh, posed answer was, well, maybe it was the um, core of a galaxy that was here before, a small galaxy. And another idea was, well, maybe it was just a, such a huge cloud of gas that formed those stars that they didn't get separated as they aged, like uh, most open clusters that form. Those stars, we get to see them in a they might look kind of nice, but they, the gravity of the other pole of the rest of the stars in the galaxy of make it drift apart and so that was a possibility or maybe it was two such clusters that were close to each other and so the answer is about six to ten years ago they started looking and found all three are the answer different globular clusters like that have come from different um sources in the case of this one it has a behavior as though it had nine hundred thousand suns in it but we know from the from looking at the light from it, it only has about 100,000 to 200,000 stars. The rest of that mass is a supermassive black hole at its center. That is the mark of an intermediate, it's an intermediate mass black hole, but that's the mark of a small galaxy. So what happened, it looks like, about these clusters that are around it, is there were a lot of small galaxies that had formed near the beginning of the universe, and the Milky Way came along like a second and third generation of things that were going on. It was uh, rather a late bloomer at seven and a half billion years ago. And it kind of pulled all the material off of these globular clusters and, it, and they got caught up in the, in the gravity around the Milky Way. So they're circling the Milky Way. Their age gets counted as part of the Milky Way because nowadays, when I was a kid in high school, um, they were talking about dinosaurs. Well, I was around to see them leave footprints when I was in high school. And uh, around that time, they used to say the Milky Way was seven and a half billion years old because they never allowed, uh, they, they allowed the globular cluster circling it to be uh, later acquired objects. But it turns out they were here first. Uh, and then the Milky Way formed among them and with this big size. So that's kind of an interesting object out there, sort of like a stellar retirement home. Those stars you see are about uh, in that particular um, galaxy is, are about 11 and two thirds uh, billion years old. And so that's a kind of a long way to be around. They're about to the end of losing their lives, of uh, ending their existence of average size stars. So um, as far as close to us, well, none of the globular clusters are close because they're circling around the outside of the galaxy. But that one happens to be around 25,000 light years from Earth. And it's in the constellation uh, Hercules. So that constellation was named after a Roman mythological hero who happened to be adapted from a Greek myth uh, of Heracles. So he called Hercules, and that constellation actually was in the first group of constella uh, 45 constellations 
that a scientist and um, uh, half Egyptian, half Greek researcher named Ptolemy the 13th put in a book called The Almagest. We later took a few away and put some extra ones back in. So now we have 88 constellations, but Hercules was one of the first. And it's up there um, nicely in the sky for us to see this. And there happens to be three other globular clusters in that constellation. Okay, Jim, that's about all I got. Very good. Um, Dane asks, uh, how do you know how far away stars and galaxies are from the telescope? You want to answer that, Jim? Yeah, there's a couple of different ways that all are, are part of the same uh, discipline of trying to figure that out. You can do it um, with the light that's coming from them, sometimes photometrically and sometimes with uh, spectroscopically. You can look at it and see just what's happening to it. And we've kind of decided right now that the universe is expanding pretty fast. So that means any light you get from something that's very far away from you is going to be shifted to the red end of the spectrum. You know, when a train is going away from you or a fire engine is going away from you, the sound drops. Light does the same thing when you're traveling. So the um, uh, if you look at the spectrum, it looks like stars should look, but they're they're shifted. They got the wrong frequency of light. Well, that's how you know what the redshift was to get here. That gives you a clue as to where it was when it started out. And that gets you a uh, hint at the distance. There is another uh, method when they're kind of close to us called parallax, where they'll actually seem to shift in the sky when you move from one side of the solar system to the other through the year. So if you take data measurements at one time, six months later, you take the same measurements, you might see a, a shift in space to it. You can work out that angle, and that will give you a hint as to how far away it is. Um, so we got the spectrum, and then we got photometrics. That's where we actually take a picture of it and see how bright it is. And we know from the chemistry that we're getting out of the spectroscope how bright it should be because we look at its movement, of the, uh, the movement of the object, so we're pretty sure we can understand what its mass is. So a certain mass of a certain chemistry should have a certain light pattern. And what happens is if it's got a little bit different, we can actually push that number that we're expecting to see out to the right distance. And so those three ways of Parallax are really close things, but for the fire the things away, usually we do spectroscopically or, or radiometrically. We look at them, and um, if we assume a spherical cow, it happens to work out. And that's, how, that's what we're doing, and we're sticking with it till we find a different way. Well, there you go. Thanks, Jim. That was a good explanation of the... Yeah, there's a lot of tools that astronomers have in their uh, toolbox to be able to determine uh, different things, you know, the, the spectrum of and what elements are made up in stars and how far away things are and things like that. So it's uh, it's pretty awesome. They've got a lot of different ways, you, you know, now, you know, currently we've got a lot of tools and a lot of technology at our disposal. Just think back in the days of Galileo and some of the early astronomers, uh, they didn't have computers. They didn't have the knowledge base. They were figuring it out as we went. And I'm just always amazed um, that they were able to get a lot of things right. All right, uh, over to you, Bernie, for the next one. Okay. Let's see if we can get the share going here. Alrighty. And you should see a galaxy. We do. All right. As you probably figured out, this is galaxy season. Um, the sky is just covered with galaxies right now. Part of it is because uh, one of the major super clusters of galaxies up in Virgo uh, is prominent in the sky. So Virgo, between Virgo and um, uh, uh, Berenices, uh, the, uh, the sky is just crammed with galaxies. So I've got uh, a galaxy up here. This is called M101. It's also called uh, the Pinwheel Galaxy. 
uh, M101 is uh, a fairly bright galaxy and it's relatively close by um, in comparison to many of them. Uh, this one is 27 million light years from Earth. Um, it's, it's obviously called a pinwheel because of its uh, 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 spiraling arms. Uh, there's at least one, two, three, four, five, at least five spiraling arms that are easily counted uh, radiating out uh, from the center point. Now, a couple of things uh, when you look at galaxies uh, on uh, uh, and through telescopes, uh, you see stars all around the galaxy. And a lot of people get confused. They don't understand what those stars are that are around the galaxy. Well, those, those have nothing to do with the galaxy at all. Those stars that you see in the in the field are all stars that are in our galaxy. These are Milky Way stars. To look through our galaxy to see a distant object like another galaxy, you have to look through the field of stars in our galaxy. So those stars that you see are mm, 10, thousand light years, maybe 20,000 light years away um, on the as you view out through our galaxy to the distant galaxy that's beyond. So once you reach the end of our galaxy, the edge of our galaxy, then from there all the way out to where that galaxy is located, uh, in this case 27 million light years, there is nothing. It's intergalactic space, and there's basically nothing there, nothing of matter that we are familiar with. Uh, the uh, spiral galaxy, and uh, this one's in Ursa Major, by the way, uh, the Great Bear, and it's comprised of uh, about a billion stars. So in those spiraling arms, and then that, Right, central core, you add that all together and you've got about a billion stars there that are glowing back at us. Now that bright central core is not a star. It's millions of stars that are all very close together in that central core. And that's, that's why uh, it's bright in that area. Uh, that's millions of stars that are located right there. Uh, this one is about 150,000 light years in diameter. So it's about 50% wider than the Milky Way galaxy. So the Milky Way is a little smaller than this. Not that much smaller, but a little bit smaller. This one was discovered in 1781. So um, to be able to... to to see a, a, a galaxy back then, it had to be bright. And it was uh, discovered by uh, Pierre Michon, who was uh, a, a friend of, of uh, Messier, a, a, a fellow astronomer. Uh, and he and Messier were um, the, put forward most of the objects that are in the Messier list. Um, and uh, this is M101 on the Messier list. If you look closely uh, on the arms themselves, you'll notice there's bright knots in them, kind of spots where it's it's brighter. Uh, there's one, one almost straight up uh, on the on the arm that extends to the left and then upwards, right about at its end. You can see a bright knot in the one that goes down. You can see a couple of bright knots in it. Uh, and of course, uh, there's several others spread out in, in within the galaxy. These are uh, what, what's called H2 regions. They're areas in the arms of this galaxy that are rich in hydrogen, hydrogen gas. And that richness causes 
a higher level of star formation. So they, there's more stars being born in that area, and therefore that area is brighter because of it. Um, so this is a, a, an excellent example of a, uh, a true spiral galaxy. And absolutely a gorgeous view. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. Uh, I like to show it at star parties whenever I can. Well, one yeah. of the nice things about this one is it's it's circumpolar, or almost circumpolar, so you can look at it just about any time of the year. Yeah, and it just shows the spiral arms. Just, I mean, it's a perfect face-on view and just really shows the spiral arms nicely. All right, thanks, Bernie. Uh, mm -hmm. Rick, you ready? Yeah. Okay, so I've got a little bit of a twofer for you. First of all, in the center there is um, another example of a, a globular star cluster. This one is known as uh, another Messier object. Uh, Messier 53, uh, it was actually um, discovered, uh, he didn't discover it though, he independently discovered it, but it had actually been discovered in 1775 by uh, Johann Bode, um, and then in 1777, Charles Messier independently uh, discovered it. Um, this one isn't quite as um, big as uh, the one that Jim showed you earlier, but it's still a, a pretty uh, globular cluster. cluster. It, this one is um, uh, close to our galactic center. It's between us and our galactic center. Um, we sit in one arm. Uh, there's another arm in between us and this, and this cluster. It's pretty close to the center relative to us. Now, what you're getting here as a bonus is down in the lower left, you'll see a smattering of stars down there. Um, it's looser, but that is also a globular cluster um, known as uh, NGC uh, 5053. So I just, I just happened to get that one in the frame here, the way I oriented my, my camera, I was able to pull that one in. If I'd been twisted a little bit one way or the other, it would have been out of the frame, but. You can see that other one down down there. Um, this one is um, everything else I've been showing you has been millions of light years away. This one's close. It's only uh, fifty eight thousand light years away. So, you know, it's in the neighborhood. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, that is uh, uh, relatively close. We're uh, we in our galaxy in the Milky Way galaxy, the solar system, our sun resides about 26,000 light years from the center. So we're about halfway out from the center. The, the Milky Way galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. So each side of the galaxy is roughly about 50,000 light years out to the edge and we're 26,000 light years. So about halfway out from the, uh, from the center. And uh, so this one, these, this gal, uh, globular cluster being 50, you know, 8,000, 50 some odd thousand light years away means that it's probably on the other side of the, the galactic core from us um, because it is beyond the 26,000 uh, light years. It's, uh, it's also uh, a little unusual from some of the other clusters. I don't, Jim didn't mention this earlier, but a lot of the globular clusters actually sit they don't sit in the plane of our galaxy. They sit just above and just below. This one actually sits more in the plane of our galaxy. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, and so globulars are globulars are interesting objects. They are. Well, and you know, I think Jim maybe even referred to it uh, earlier, but globular clusters are so dense that uh, you know a lot of times they're just a you know, a tenth or two tenths of a light year apart, the stars are, whereas our nearest star 
is four light years away, or over four light years mm -hmm. away. So if you were, if we lived in a globular cluster, uh, we would have stars everywhere in the night sky and lots yeah. and lots of bright ones. <laughs> All right, thank you. Jim, you ready? Uh, yeah, I can think I can give it a shot. And unfortunately, I jumped to the wrong frame first. One second. And full screen, that's better. I'll tab and go to share my screen. There. And let's try this one. And there. OK. Lots of bright things in that object. Uh, that we're looking at, and the sky is kind of gray. And the reason it is, is I turned up the brightness as much as I can, because I'm looking at something that's a, quite a ways away. Everything I've been showing you so far has been more on the order of uh, 15 to 22 seconds I've been using. This one I've had to go over 40 seconds, and that's that gray ball right in the upper right part there. And let me get my script here. And that thing is, I'll give you the fancy name for it. It's called Intergalactic Wanderer. And it's catalog of numbers NGC 2419. It's another globular cluster. And it's in the constellation Lynx. The big difference about it is the reason the sky is so gray and looking goofy uh, is I'm trying to identify it or try to see it. Because it's 300,000 light years away. In fact, when it was, and it's a, a bit old, it's 30,000 light years from the uh, Milky Way Galactic Center. It's 12.3 billion years old. The nickname, the Intergalactic Wander, was given to it when um, it was erroneously thought to be outside uh, the Milky Way's influence when it was discovered back in the 1700s. Its orbit takes it further away from the galactic center than are the Magellanic clouds on the opposite side of the ga uh, galaxy. So we've got two these two small galaxies on one side of us that are a little more uh, a little more than half the distance the, to the intergalactic wander glob. So it was pro apparently wandering around, and it got captured by the Milky Way's gravity, and now it's uh, it's actually circling. But because it's so far away, it takes over one billion years to do one orbit. So that thing's kind of an old one. It's a long way out there. And um, uh, I'm sorry, 3 billion years to make a trip around. It's one of the brightest and most massive globular clusters of the galaxy. It's 900,000 times more massive than the sun. If you were looking at that uh, globular cluster from inside the Andromeda galaxy, it would be the brightest single object in the Milky Way. So it's, it's hooked to us but it actually would look like the brightest thing we have if you looked at it from the Milky Way. So there's another globular cluster. And that's one of the other things we can see some of in this season because we're looking up away from the plane of the galaxy. So that one's kind of, uh, kind of interesting, I thought, because of its distance and its aid being, uh, being, being over 12 billion years old. And that's another globular cluster, and I promise I won't show another one. Jim? Uh, Jim's on his way back. He stepped out here for a minute. Oh, okay. Well, the okay, globular yes. clusters I always think are interesting because we think they come from two different ways. And I, I mentioned earlier that we kind of solved that problem. And that was about eight or nine years ago. Kitt Peak University here in Tucson was part of the group working on it. And they got nitrogen cooled, uh, very uh, powerful cameras used to looking deep to see star motion behind infrared cl of dust clouds in the infrared light. And so they, um, with the nitrogen cooling on them, they're actually able to see the, the stellar motions at the cores of some of these uh, globular clusters. And they said they couldn't be doing that motion if there's only a bunch of stars around. It took a, um, at least a black hole as much as an intermediate mass black hole up around 100,000 suns 
So this thing has a lot of stars in it. We know that from the body count in there and uh, of what the mass is like, but it looks like this one, a lot of that mass is also going to be some black hole that's in the center. So that was apparently a galaxy that got robbed as well. Jim? All right, very good. Yeah, that's uh, always a different one to be able to see and virtually uh, very difficult to see visually, if not impossible, but it shows up great uh, in, in the camera. All right, Bernie, you ready? At least I think you're next, Bernie, aren't you? Yeah, sorry, uh, I was uh, doing some tweaking here. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, let me see if I can bring up the share. Here we go. Share screen. All right. Okay. Back to galaxies again. As we were talking about earlier, it's galaxy season. So um, I thought I'd take the opportunity since there's so many different galaxies to look at to uh, go into maybe some of the different types of galaxies that are available and uh, defined. Uh, the, the one that we looked at previously was M101, uh, which was a true, um, the pinwheel galaxy, uh, a true spiral uh, with the uh, radiating arms coming, radiating out from the, the central core. So this one uh, is a different type of galaxy. This is, uh, by the way, this is M83, also known as NGC 5236. It's called the Southern Pinwheel Galaxy. Uh, and it's in the constellation of Hydra, which is uh, kind of down to the south uh, right now. And this particular galaxy um, is um, a barred spiral. So the one we looked at earlier was a, a true spiral. This is a barred spiral. Now, Obviously, a barred spiral going to spot uh, is uh, this bar uh, that crosses over in the center of the of the galaxy, and you can see the the central core of this galaxy uh, is uh, a bright area, much like the pinwheel was, but radiating to the left and right uh, is a bar, and then off of that bar are off the tips of that bar quite are quite obvious uh, the the uh, the spiraling arms of the galaxy so this is a, uh, a a very obvious barred spiral galaxy and there's various types of bards barred spirals but uh, this one is probably the most obvious of them um, by the way, the Milky Way, although we can't see the Milky Way be, uh, from a distance because we're in it, but if you were able to fly outside of the Milky Way and turn around and look at it, uh, most evidence currently indicates that the Milky Way is a barred spiral as well. The uh, uh, southern pinwheel is 14 million light years distant, so it, it's really not that far away. It was discovered in 1752, um, and there's lots of new star formation uh, going on in, inside this uh, this galaxy, especially on on the edges. So you'll you'll notice those knots in the uh, the arms. H2 regions as well. Uh, even though this galaxy is close, it's not part of our local group. Um, the uh, What we call the local group is uh, the D 
galaxies that are gravitationally bound to us. So uh, the, the Andromeda galaxy, the, uh, the Triangulum galaxy, uh, M33, uh, the large and small Magellanic clouds, and a few others are uh, part of what we call the local group. They, these galaxies and, and sub-galaxies are all gravitationally bound to each other. Um, and so we travel through the universe together as, as a group. Um, even though this is only 14 million light years away, uh, it's still not part of the local group. It's actually part of a, a neighboring group called the Centaurus group. So this is the Southern Pinwheel Galaxy. Another great view. And that one, uh, I mean, yeah, you can clearly see the, the bar in the center and, and as well as the spiral arms coming out of it. So that's an awesome view. All right, thanks, uh, Bernie. Rick, you ready? Not hearing you though, Rick. Yeah, it helps if I hit unmute. There you go. <laughs> so this one uh, is a uh, NGC forty five sixty five, but it does have a name. This one is known as the Needle Galaxy. Um, it is a little unusual in that we're seeing it almost exactly, um, you know, in plane with us. It's just we're looking straight on at it. And uh, that gives us an, an unusual view of this galaxy. Um, this is an often photographed galaxy. Um, it's often used in, um, in textbooks uh, as an example galaxy. Um, one reason is it, it, is, it has been, in the, at least in the past, believed that uh, this would resemble what our galaxy would look like if you were able to see it from a distance. Um, so it's, it's one example that they that they use. Um, this galaxy is um, <clears throat> a little bit closer than some of the other ones I've shown you tonight. This one's about 39 million light years away. So a little bit closer. It's also why it appears a little bit larger than some of the other ones that, that I've shown you. Um, it was discovered in um, 1785 by William Herschel. Uh, William Herschel and his uh, other uh, helpers uh, discovered a, a lot of things in this period. And you can see, one thing you can see is cutting right across the center. Uh, you can see a, a line coming across here. That's known as a dust lane. Um, if if I were to take longer exposures and do more, a little bit more processing, that, that line would, be, would, would come across as, as, as red. It's got a reddish uh, hue to it. You can't quite see it in this because we're doing kind of, you know, quick and on the fly processing here. But um, so that is the needle galaxy. Anybody else got anything to add? That's a, yeah, it's a really neat, uh, really great cross section. You know, like you said, looking edge on with a very distinctive dust lane going right yeah. through the center. Yet you can still clearly see the core. Yeah. The, the central bulge. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's really nice. And you've got actually several other galaxies in the field too. I see. Yeah, one. <laughs> yeah. There's there's one down here that I managed to pick up. Uh, there's one over here. You can see a slight one there. Um, yeah, yeah, anything like a smudge and not a point is generally a a galaxy. Yeah, very nice. All right, thanks, Rick. Uh -huh. All right, Jim, over to you. Okie doke. Um, get the screen up there. I um, do have something that's kind of interesting on uh, Galaxy Day here. Get it. And 
Okay. Make sure the picture's okay. Yeah, that's them. Well, it's a little jiggly because I happened to bump the telescope while I was doing that. So we have to wait about 15 seconds for a calm down with the two uh, sign of kind of grayish blobs uh, in there are actually two galaxies that have interacted with each other. And since it's taking me 41 seconds of time to pull them out, I have to wait about another 14 seconds before it takes the picture again and, um, and gets us that. Those are called the antenna. In the uh, new general catalog, their numbers are 4038 uh, and 4039. And they, the smaller, the one on the left passed behind or partly through the other galaxy. And the reason you see these hooks on there is because uh, sometimes they're called the tadpoles or sometimes, and there's also a name ringtail galaxies for, for that. The reason is what you see is gray uh, hook coming off the right-hand one towards the other blob. And then there's some arcing back for that is that's new stars being formed in gas that they pulled off each other. Outer gas that the passing galaxy was stronger than the core of its own galaxy. And so now they're hooking in. Yeah. The antennas of an insect feeling around. So that's how it got the name antenna. And um, that's, uh, it took me a little work to bring that in because um, those two guys are 45 million light years away. Uh, they're in uh, uh, Galaxy Corvus, where we were looking at the um, uh, Stargate a little bit ago. Um, these two spiral galaxies, they started to interact about 600 million years ago. It makes the antenna galaxies one of the nearest and youngest examples of colliding galaxies. Those get two galaxies are undergoing a collision. It's just they happen to have run by each other now and they're about to circle around and hit each other again. And this takes place on hundreds of millions of year uh, schedules as it does it. When we happen to intersect and merge with Andromeda, it's not gonna be peaceful. And it's not gonna happen just in one um, smack. They're, gonna, they're, they're each moving very fast in different directions. And when they go through each other, the gravity that they're running into isn't enough to slow it down. So it becomes a periodic thing that it, it takes it a long time for it to go back and forth. Those two galaxies are spirals. They won't keep their spiral identity after they collide. Spiral galaxies are usually the basic form of galaxies um, that uh, get developed. After they interact with other galaxies, the confusing gravitational fields of the elements that are in it are no longer in the same disk. They're perpendicular somewhat or tilted at an angle. And what happens is that that, that gravity from an odd place causes the stars to uh, rearrange themselves. And it ends up usually making sort of a, um, a common, uh, anywhere from the size of, of uh, from the looks of a beach ball all the way out to maybe a football. Those are called elliptical galaxies. They can't be spirals again because the gravity just was too disruptive to put them there. So the nuclei of the two galaxies are gonna join and become one giant galaxy. Um, that group of galaxies, those two have five other ones with them that are a lot dimmer. And they're called the antenna galaxies or the antenna or the NG4038 group. So they're a small family of five galaxies, like we've got a few more of that in our local group around us. They're 45 million uh, light years away. And the galaxies um, get those long, two long tails of stars. They drag out gas and dust ejected from the galaxies as a result of the first pass. Those hooks, like I said, resemble an insect's antenna. Uh, a single galaxy will be the result about 400 million years from now. So it takes a billion years for the process of those two to fly through each other once or twice and then form uh, an entity that's called an elliptical galaxy. And that's pretty much like what's gonna happen with our Milky Way and its collision with the Andromeda galaxy. Um, this is called, well, how this happens, and for the quiz tomorrow morning, this is called the Kumray sequence of how galaxies smack into each other, come apart and come back in. Um, and for, get, for a galaxy evolution was developed by successfully modeling what happened in these two galaxies. 
So they're close enough to study and we're doing it pretty actively to figure out what's going on in colliding galaxies. Yeah, Jim? and as you uh, mentioned, Jim, nothing in the cosmos happens fast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, excellent. Yeah, that's, uh, that's cool. I always like to see the interacting galaxies because uh, like you mentioned, it's, it's the fate of uh, the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy in four to five billion years. And uh, once we're done with that, we'll merge into a huge galaxy, but we're gonna be uh, kind of stirring things up as it happens. You can tell how that right-hand galaxy used to be a spiral and right. it got disrupted on the side where the other galaxy flew through. Yeah. And Coupe de Grasse is gonna come in, a Coupe de Grasse is gonna come in 400 year, million years. A long time to wait. All right, thanks, Jim. Bernie, you ready? I am. Let's see what we can do here about sharing. There we go. Okay. This is M87. Uh, Jim made reference to uh, M87 earlier. Uh, M87 is um, uh, a giant, almost a super giant um, elliptical galaxy uh, in Virgo. And um, the uh, galaxy itself being an elliptical and I'm showing you an elliptical because it is the third of the three typical galaxies that you see in this, um, the spirals, the barred spirals, and the ellipticals. Uh, the elliptical in a telescope looks like a big fuzzball. So you've got a, a bright central core uh, and a big fuzzy area around it with no obvious arms or bars uh, or anything to discern it as being a galaxy other than the fact that it's fuzzy and um, and obviously at a great distance. Uh, M87 uh, is uh, uh, about a trillion stars. So it's a massive galaxy was discovered in 1781 by Messier. And uh, that's why it's uh, M87 on his uh, list of, um, of galaxies. Now, the, the big claim to fame, of course, with M87 now uh, is the fact that um, it was the first galaxy to have its central supermassive black hole imaged uh, back uh, uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, let me see if I can get my notes organized here so I can see them a little better. Sorry about that. Things don't always work in the dark as well as you want them to. And it is definitely dark out here. Yeah, it's, it's dark now. Uh, okay, so uh, in the center of uh, M87, by, by the way, M87 is 53 million light years away. Um, it, uh, it has uh, a supermassive black hole. And that black hole uh, is... Uh, uh, it, it has the black hole itself has a mass of six and a half billion suns. So if you can imagine six and a half billion suns, um, suns of a, like our sun, jammed into that black hole. It's a massive black hole. And because it's so huge, um, it eats about the equivalent of, of 90 Earths a day just by sucking in um, stellar matter. 
uh, 90 Earths a day. Now, uh, this black hole uh, also has, um, uh, it's spinning and out of its, uh, um, out of its uh, poles, if you will, north and south poles are jets of energy, um, X-rays, gamma rays, everything you can imagine uh, that, that are shot out these jets uh, from the, uh, the spinning of the black hole. And those jets on a really good night with a very good telescope, uh, you can actually see uh, one of the two jets. And I'm looking tonight, I do not see it. Uh, but on a good night, you can see uh, just a, the faintest of little blue bars that kind of stick out the side of it. No, it's not. It's not there tonight. I don't see it, uh, but I, I have seen it in the past. Uh, the the jet of energy from the supermassive black hole uh, that's in the center of of the galaxy. So that's uh, that's M eighty seven, and it is a massive super uh, sized galaxy. I, I noticed uh, I had a satellite go through the field there from the uh, center, upper up, upper center to, to lower right. Maybe you can see it, just the faintest of little streaks, uh, but um, had a satellite go through the, the field a little while ago. Anyway, that's uh, M87. Kind of hard to miss the satellites anymore. There's getting to be lots of them up there. Mm. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, we were when Rick was showing Mark Carrion's chain earlier. I went over to the planetarium program, and yes, M87 is actually below that chain, so uh, it is. Um, but it is, yeah, like you said, it's a massive, massive galaxy. Yeah, the the Mercurian's chain is just just outside of this field, uh, and uh, just above it. Yeah. All right. Very nice. Thanks, Bernie. Um, Rick, over to you. Yeah, I got a couple, a few more good ones for you here. This pretty little grouping is known as the Leo triplet. These sit up in the constellation Leo in that in that area they are all part of the same uh galactic group G galaxies tend to uh congregate together in clusters and these three are in a in that same cluster together and there's other galaxies nearby that are part of that that same cluster um starting on the upper left that one is m65 uh, again, discovered by uh, uh, Charles Messier in around 1780. Um, it's about 42 million light years away, and it's a another good example of a of a fire of a spiral galaxy. Down below that is uh, M66, which uh, we can guess he probably discovered on the same day because he was probably looking at them both at the same time in his. In, in his telescope um it's uh you can tell it, it has a little more of an unusual shape you can kind of see there's that bright center part of the bottom there's kind of an arm kind of spinning out there um it's actually got got two arms that kind of spin out but just in this resolution i've got here you can see one uh, so it's got kind of an unusual shape to it and then um, down here at the bottom is uh, the one I I, I kind of like the best. Um, this is uh, NGC 3628. Uh, kind of a shame this little pretty one doesn't have a better name to it. Um, but again, we're we're seeing it uh, seeing it edge on. You can see a a, a dust lane running through there. Um, again, if if I had more time to process this, the center core here would have a nice. Uh, orange or, or red hue to it um and this one's about 35 million light years away but um 
it's a little hard. This one's harder to see with binoculars, with a telescope, uh, visually. Uh, these other two are pretty bright. They're pretty easy to see uh, through a pair of binoculars or with, uh, with a decent-sized um, telescope. So that is the Leo triplet. This is a favorite of astrophotographers. It's a, you get the three for the price of one, and they're fairly close and large, so it's uh, easy, easy framing to get all three of these in the same picture. Yeah, it's a favorite for visual uh, astronomers too. It's uh, I, I love to show this one at the Grand Canyon Star Party when we do yeah. uh, that in June, and yeah. uh, because the skies are so dark up there and they just yeah. really pop. Yeah, you you can that, get all three of them up there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that that's called the Hamburger Galaxy, by the way. Oh, it does have a name. Yeah, it's not in my database having a name, but yeah, yeah you can that's, that's why that's that is. The, you can see that's the, the hamburger and the buns on both sides. <laughs> yeah, well, and the way I the way I remember is because if you look on the extreme ed edges, uh, it flay it flares out like like lettuce. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I'm getting hungry now. Yeah, me too. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, Rick. Um, Jim, over to you. Okay. Let me try to manipulate the all the optional windows here. This and get you. There we are. Now I'm going to share the screen. I picked the right screen to share here. And one last thing here, I need to get this up. Okay, I hope you got it coming through there. That little thing near the top of the screen is called the Black Eye Galaxy. It's another Messier object, object number 64. You might notice there's a similarity among some of the, or uh, uh, an acquaintance of the numbers, the numbers in a sequence. Well, that was because when Messier built his catalog, first object he discovered was in uh, the Taurus, uh, uh, Taurus uh, constellation, and it was M1, the Crab Nebula. And as he would observe at night, he would find um, a number of objects that night and repeat it every couple of days. And Pierre Michain was his partner. They both worked for the French Navy. And... Um, Messier's background is a little interesting. Um, his father was fairly wealthy, a good farmer in France, um, and had many farm hands that could make the farm run. But uh, Charles was only 11 when his father passed away. So the family kept running the farm, the extended family, brothers of his father or his uncles uh, and stuff coming in and all the farm hands. So Charles was a couch potato when he was 11. He liked to study math. He got fairly good at some forms of mathematics and some other and artwork. But by the time he was about 19, his uncle was really annoyed with him sitting around and not really being involved with much. So he got him a job with the French Navy. Now, if you take a look back what was going around in the 1750s, 1760s, when he first started doing this, um, the French were still superstitious about the sky. And their admiralty leadership wanted to know uh, what the experience was with comets because they, were, they thought comets foretold the future. And so Charles was hired along with Machine to be, his the job title was draftsman and chronicler of dynamic events. So his job for his entire professional career was to report comet sightings. And so he became enamored with finding comets. So he built this wonderful catalog, 110 of some of the most gorgeous, even though he didn't necessarily find 110 uh, as published, but other researchers coming after him read his notes and he, they said he certainly should have seen this one uh, or that one. And some of them didn't come out to the mid uh, 1900s uh, when other researchers were looking at it because they were in his logs, but he never published them in a book. So anyway, he put this book together, some of the most spectacular beautiful objects in the night sky so people would avoid them. And his forward to his first group of the first 40, first book of the first 40 said he is putting this um, uh, document together, this book together, so that he can inform astronomers of objects not worthy to be studied. 
So some of the some of the pretty things we're showing tonight, Char, uh, Charles Messier didn't want you to waste time on it. Just thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, back to M64, the Black Eye Galaxy. Uh, it's also called the Evil Eye Galaxy. Messier 64, it's an isolated spiral galaxy. It's isolated because there's not a lot of galaxies around it, but it's only 17 million light years away. So it's fairly close, just like um, some of the ones up near the Big Dipper are M81, M82. Those are pretty close, too, uh, to us. It's in. It appears to be in the constellation of Coma Berenices. Um, that's where the, uh, if you really want some fantastic trivia, that's where the North Galactic Pole is. That's where our galaxy rotates under. So uh, uh, it was discovered in 1779. Um, by Charles Messier, it's a, that dark band of absorbing dust partially in front of the bright nucleus area gives the rise to its nickname of Black Eye or Evil Eye Galaxy. Um, it really stands out uh, because of its physical size and it's, it's just brightness. So it's always, I like it uh, as an object to look at and uh, uh, it just has character with that big dust band. Usually that means something's going on in the core, like a, uh, uh, a black hole has gone through an eating phase and really disturbed things. When the, uh, when the dynamic um, after effects of a black hole doing a swallowing a large lunch comes, it tends to uh, push any dust laying around altogether. And so you'll get these dark regions. Um, and it'll be kind of uh, uh, interesting to look at. It gives the galaxy character. So that's um, M64 in Coma Berenices, the Black Eye Galaxy. Yeah, I just love it how things just kind of come around in history. You know, where some of the best objects for us amateurs to look at were ones that uh, Charles Messier wanted to avoid because he didn't want to confuse them as comets. All right. Thanks, Jim. All right. So we're going to do one more each uh, and then wrap things up uh, since it's getting uh, close to quitting time. So, uh, Bernie, let's go back to you. All right. There we go. Okay, so uh, my object now is um, what's called M97. M97 uh, is also known as the Owl Nebula. And um, it's a beautiful little blue fuzzball in the sky. Um, it's one of my favorites. It's in Ursa Major, um, not too far from, in fact, I think it's in the bowl of the Big Dipper. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, the Big Dipper wasn't pouring milk that day. Maybe it was pouring little little blueberries. Um, the uh, Owl Nebula is, is called a planetary nebula, and it's called a planetary nebula because it it encircles a star. So if you, if I zoom in a little bit, if I can, oh, maybe it's at max zoom now, but uh, if you look dead center, you'll see uh, a very small little point of light. Uh, that's the central star. And that's the star that caused or created uh, this big bull, big, big blue ball uh, by exploding. And uh, it exploded about 8,000 years ago. Now, it's not that somebody 8,000 years ago write it, wrote it down and said, I saw this happen. Um, but the um, by analyzing the velocity and the, the speed at which this is growing in size, you can backtrack to the point where it was back at its source, which and that comes out to about 8,000 years. 
It's about two light years wide uh, from left to right. So it's about the half the distance between us and and the nearest star to us, um, Proxima Centauri. So it's it's huge um, uh, in in that area of the sky. Um, it was discovered in 1781, and uh, the central star is a white dwarf star. That little tiny point of light right in the center is a, a white dwarf star, and it's a super hot white dwarf. Uh, the surface temperature is estimated to be around 123,000 degrees Kelvin, uh, which equates to about 220,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So an extremely hot star. Now, the reason it's called the owl is because those two kind of dark patches on either side of the central star, uh, you can think of those as being the eyes of the owl, with the central star being the the little beak of the owl. So if you if you tip this image, uh, or if you tip your head to the left, uh, and then it's more obvious that it looks like the face of a little owl. That's why it's called the the owl nebula. Yeah, that's another fun one to, to show. Yeah, it has a such a beautiful blue too, um, that uh, it comes out really nice in uh, in imaging. Uh, the the blue is no doubt from the uh, ionization of 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 uh, a certain amount of oxygen uh, in that uh, that cloud. Yeah, and you're right, you know, you just kind of tilt your head to the left and get the orientation so the eyes are a little more horizontal and it just looks like a, an owl. Yeah, with, that, with an extra star in its left eye, but that's okay. <laughs> so the we'll, we'll let it get away with it. All right, thanks, Bernie. Rick, over to you. Yeah, I got my last one here. Uh, this is another one that's kind of unusual. So this galaxy is known as M94, and uh, I'm afraid that the, my image here doesn't do it very good justice for how complex this, um, this object is. Um, this galaxy is notable in that it has these, it has a bright core structure and that it's got kind of two rings to it that are different um, rings of star formation in different phases. And that's kind of unusual. Now, if you look closely, you'll see this bright core and then it gets this lighter area and then it gets, a, you see this dark ring around it and then it gets lighter again on the outside of it. That lighter part on the outside of it, which is very hard to see in this picture, that's the outer ring of the, um, of the star formation area. The, in more detailed uh, images of this, this galaxy has a spectacularly tight arms inside of it. It's got lots of arms, and they're very, very tight um, in there. Um, so this is a, a very um, unusual galaxy for uh, astronomers to, to study. What's, what are the processes going on in, inside of this? Um, it's about, um, this one's fairly close to us. It's, it's about uh, um, 14 to 16 million light years away. So it's one of the closer ones to us. Um, let's see. Any other little notes here? Uh, Jim's or Bernie, do you guys have anything to add on this one? Um, no, it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of uh, nondescript, but 
the the way you were kind of highlighting everything with your cursor and pointing yeah. it out really makes it you know you can overlook a lot of that kind of stuff when you're just looking yeah. at it you see yeah it, i think it takes it. really takes a long exposure to really pull out some of that detail but uh it's it's there yeah well Even and this image it's kind of an unusual looking thing yeah and you know that's that is true with a lot of astronomical objects that we look at is a lot of times when you're especially when you're looking visual and you're looking to an eyepiece the longer you take the more you'll be able to you know your eye will be able to process your brain will process and and more detail you'll you'll see popping out a lot of times especially on the fainter objects we always we tell um, people that are looking to the telescope to use your averted vision or your peripheral vision. So you would, you know, if the, if the object's right in the middle, you'd look off to the one side and look at it out of the corner of your eye, and you're going to be able to see a little bit more detail because of your uh, um, the rods for your night vision are, are out on, on that side, of, uh, out on the edge of the eye, and that allows you to see uh, fainter objects, fainter stuff a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I think uh, if you were to look at this with a telescope, probably about all you'd be able to see is that bright, that bright core there, even that this, this dimmer outer ring here, I don't think you'd be able to see very well. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks guys. Um, so we are going to probably wrap it up there. Um, I do want to, yeah. Did get an object back. Oh, did you? All right. Yeah, I smacked the uh, my mount in the head, and uh, it seems to be behaving itself now. So right, I got something kind of nice that I can show right now. Go for it. Okay, let me um, get it full screen here, and I didn't take the time to uh, center it real pretty and stuff because I wanted to get it in there. And that's this, and this, and this guy, and there. Okay. And I just am doing spur of the moment because uh, I uh, had a problem with trying to get the object I wanted to, and it didn't turn out so well. Okay, what should be there in the bottom center of the, uh, the bottom center of the screen is the, uh, it's called the Sombrero Galaxy, as you might guess from the shape. Um, it's in the constellation Corvus as some of the other things we've been looking at. Uh, its classification is unusual. It's called a peculiar. It's in a class of peculiar ga galaxies because it's unclear what it should be. It's on the borders between Virgo and Corvus, about 31 million light years from the Milky Way galaxy. It's about 95,000 light years in diameter, bigger than the Milky Way, about a, about a thousand light years or so bigger. It's got a very bright nucleus and an unusually large central bulge, which makes, makes it look like a spiral galaxy. Yet this prominent dust lane down the middle of that thing uh, in the outer disk, which is viewed almost edge on, is characteristic of um, a spiral. I mean, it's a characteristic of an elliptical galaxy. So there's still a lot of discussion going on right now. The community tends to lean towards uh, stopping um, discussing it and just call it a spiral galaxy. It's got a lot of dust, one or the other. Um, they looked, we can look from here with, um, as I said, cool telescopes, great infrared penetration, much more we can do now than we could even do 20 years ago, looking into that galaxy's core, inside the dust in the, in the core, the nuclear, the nucleus stars have velocities that require a supermassive black hole of over 1 billion solar masses. So that is pretty a pretty, a, pretty, a pretty big number for a spiral galaxy. You can get big, it's not uncommon to get over a billion solar, up to tens of billion solar masses in ellipticals because that's usually the result of merging a couple of galaxies to make that. 
but this galaxy still having a characteristic of a spiral to have a one billion solar mass uh, um, black hole in the center is uh, pretty profound in there. Um, the let's see if there's anything else I can pull out about that thing. It's um, that was one of the last objects Messier found before he before he passed away. It's Messier object number 104. Actually, somewhere around Messier, one, between 100 and 104, all they could build from there out to Messier object 110 is from his notes. And it started out, he stopped uh, forming these galaxies, or logging these Messier objects, uh, not to look at them because they're not comets, um, back around, I guess, in the early 1800s. And one wish of his father's did come true. Um, Messier became um, so uh, famous for his spectacular uh, w watching of the night sky and logging these things and identifying them that he was actually entered into the, uh, he was admitted to the French Academy of Sciences. That usually didn't happen for somebody in the agriculture class. If you were in a farming class like that, you were thought of as a second class character. His father had always wanted him to be a scientist get into something where he could be on the uh, more favored part of French society at the time. And it turned out he did. He got uh, into the French Academy of Sciences before he died. Later, um, some of the objects in that catalog between 100 and 110 were added during the American Civil War by an American astronomer. And also in the early 1900s, uh, some of the last numbers were added by people who were able to uh, be allowed to examine his logs, not what he not what he reported to the French government. So anyway, Sombrero Galaxy, another beautiful object in Corvus, only only 31 million light years from us, but we're going to probably settle on it being a spiral galaxy with a super super massive black hole of one billion solar masses. Okay, yeah, John. And, and that's a, another great one to see in a telescope, both visually and. Uh... And as an image, uh, it just, you know, it looks like, uh, kind of looks like a sombrero hat. And and it's just, you know, looking at an edge-on galaxy like that, it's just awesome. And it would, Jim, in a, ca in, in a telescope, but I've got the camera on it. And I installed the camera so we could see the Stargate cluster in the way that it was in the movie. You know, the, tr the triangle inside a triangle. If I'd have had the sombrero looking like a sombrero, it would have been twisted off laying on the side and it would be hard to tell the larger um, isosceles triangle and then the inner isosceles triangle ro rotated around in it. So I did that on the first object and let it roll. And now we've got a sideways sombrero. Awesome. All right. Thanks, uh, Jim. And thanks, uh, guys, for everything. Um, we'll go around the horn here and give you all a chance to... Uh, say a, a couple of wrap-up uh, words. I appreciate everybody hanging with us. Uh, it's, uh, as I mentioned and saw in, in the chat, uh, it's late over on the East Coast. It's even getting kind of late here. It's almost uh, 10 o'clock, but uh, uh, we we really enjoy doing these things. It's just a lot of fun. Um, it gives us a chance to share astronomy. We're All four of us are really into doing outreach and to doing events. Um, I mentioned just briefly uh, a few minutes ago that uh, we we have the Grand Canyon Star Party coming up, and I just want to put a plug in for that because we do that every June and uh, around the new moon. So if you haven't been to the Grand Canyon for a while or you're interested in, in coming out, if you try to do it around the new moon in June, uh, you'll have an opportunity to look through a whole lot of telescopes. We typically set up about 60 telescopes a night We'll have anywhere from 1,500 to 1,800 uh, participants coming through. And, uh, and it's just a, a lot of fun. The skies are incredibly dark up there. You're up at 7,000 feet, so you're that much closer to, uh, to what you're looking at, less atmosphere to look through. And so the sky can actually take on a three-dimensional look. In fact, the first night... You know, each year when I'm up there, the first night I'm looking, I usually have to take about a half hour, 45 minutes to orient myself in the night sky because there's so many stars, I, don't, I can't pick out the constellations. And so that's a really, really good problem to have. So definitely come join us sometime. Uh, this year is going to be June 10th through the 17th. 
And uh, but it's on our website. If you go to our um, TucsonAstronomy.org website, there's a work through the menu, and you'll you'll find the the Grand Canyon Star Party. So I appreciate everybody coming, uh, hanging with us tonight. It's a lot of fun. Our next one's going to be October 10th, later this year. Uh, a little bit earlier since it's uh, later in the year and sunsets uh, earlier. So that'll be good. And we'll be streaming it to our YouTube channel. So spread the word. Um, about a week or two weeks before, I'll create the event so you can uh, follow it when you get there. All right. Well, let's uh, go around the horn. Uh, why don't we start with you, Bernie, and uh, you can say any, a, few, a few words. Yeah, it was uh, great fun tonight. Uh, got a chance to look at uh, a bunch of different galaxies. Uh, I, I'm going to leave you with with one last galaxy here, uh, just real quick, because uh, I brought it up. So I'm going to uh, going to give it a show. Oh, 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 maybe I can't. Oh, go ahead if you can. Start. Uh, maybe then uh, maybe it'll go now. No, nope, didn't. All right, how's that? Yep. Okay, this is uh, called Centaurus A. It's a uh, um, beautiful, large uh, galaxy um, in. Um, uh, in the constellation Centaurus. And it's difficult to see in northern latitudes. Uh, anybody up in the northern part of the country or Canada, you cannot see this. It's too far down. Uh, you have to be in uh, the southern U.S. or or, or even further south. Uh, but this is Centaurus A. Eh? It's, uh, it's a, a very famous, uh, I'm sorry, uh, radio and Radio X-ray gives off just about everything on the electromagnetic spectrum, and I believe it's one of the images of objects shown at the beginning of or at the end of the outer limits. And it seems to me I remember seeing it on that show. Anyway, just thought I'd leave you with that. Centaurus A. Excellent. Yeah, that's uh, that's a fun one to look at as well. Okay. First Rick. time I saw that in a telescope, I I called it a hamburger. It looked just like a hamburger. In oh, a the dust lane. Yeah. The dust lane yeah. across it is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. The the one thing I'd like to remind everybody is, um, if you've enjoyed what we've shown here tonight, um, go out there and at night and look up. Um, if you own a pair of binoculars take them out and just start looking around. You'll be surprised at what you can see just with a pair of binoculars. There's a lot of free astronomy apps for both Apple and Android um, that can help show you where things are. Um, there's a lot of things you can see with a pair of binoculars. Just sit in a chair and enjoy the evening and look up and you'll be surprised at what you can see in the sky. Yeah, and if you can find yourself a, a good dark site, a lot of times I'll just do that. I won't even get out of telescope. I'll just lean right. back my uh, yeah. you know zero G chair and just watch the sky move about above you. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Rick. Jim. Yeah, this is. Um, it's always it always feels good to get out here and do this because uh, I think it was sort of opening the universe to people who haven't really thought about looking at it before, and. Um, Another possibility um, about getting to enjoy this stuff other than online in these far too few kind of adventures is check your local um, activities uh, in, in your newspapers and see if there's any local groups that hold star parties every once in a while. Uh, sometimes schools, sometimes, uh, sometimes colleges, sometimes uh, even libraries will have open houses with uh, or, and clubs. There may be uh, astronomy clubs near you that can allow you to see what th this kind of equipment looks like, get you familiar with it, and it won't be such a mystery anymore. And you might just think of something for holidays after that. But it's really a pleasure to do this. And um, it's, uh, like I said, it's opening the sky 
to something. Uh, open your mind to, to the universe and what's out there. And okay. for those in for those in Tucson, we do have a live star party tomorrow night at Catalina State Park. Yeah, and we actually do uh, a lot of uh, live uh, events throughout the year. So definitely uh, check out the calendar on the website and uh, come join us. Okay, thanks everybody. We appreciate you guys hanging with us, and um, we'll hopefully see you in October when we do this again or one of our uh, in-person events. Everybody have a good night.